The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. And action. My name is Joseph Tate. I live in Durham. I work for a company in California. Um, I do that by shelling in mostly and by running Ansible a whole lot. Um, I am a programmer by schooling and by 12, 13 years of experience having and now recently shifting to operations. My official title is Senior DevOps Engineer, um, which means basically I run build and and deployment infrastructure for, for the company I work for. The company is called Crunch.io. You'll probably see it flash across the screen a couple of times. Um, but we are a stealthy startup, so there's not going to be much on the internet about us. Uh, so first off, what is Ansible? Ansible is a uh, cross-platform uh, configure. It's, a cross, it's also a cross between a configuration management tool uh, like CF Engine and a remote system administration tool like Puppet. Um, it's used to set, control a set of machines in a stateful, repeatable, re reliably ordered way. Um, typically with Ansible, instead of saying, if the condition is this, do this. If the condition is this other thing, do this other thing. Um, you declare a desired state and the software itself figures out how to get there. And I'll explain a little bit more of what that means as we go along. So what kinds of things can you do with Ansible? Here are a couple of things. Um, so let's look at something very simple. Hey, three slides in and already we're doing demos. Um, Ansible, it's, as, as a command, is used to run a single task. Um, Ansible Playbook is used to string a set of commands together into a repeatable process. Um, all right, so the first thing we're going to do is connect to a system, in this case, localhost, and see what variables are available. Can everybody see that? Is that too small? All right, so let's scroll up. Um, so this, this is the setup command. The setup command is kind of a, a, a base level module in Ansible that connects to a system and collects a bunch of facts about that system. Uh, you can see here what the IP address is, what the architecture is, the BIOS, all of the kinds of things you would use with LSPCI or, or LSUSB, um, kind of the, man, the, uh, the environment variables, the hard disk layout, um, the processor, the number of cores, um, the, yeah. So all of these facts are available just by, by running this setup command. Um, you'll notice I used local. That I was running against my local system. This is all of the information that's available to me as a regular user on the local system. Um, and then just by changing the inventory in the host name, I can run the same thing against a remote host. And it'll use my SSH key connect to my remote host, and pull down the same information. So uh, that's Ansible. Uh, and then if I wanted to do something like make sure that I'm not exposed to Heartbleed or something, I can run this command. We'll should go to my remote system, make sure that OpenSSL is to the latest version and return. Um, so I don't need to say 
What version is it? I don't need to say, if you're not at the latest version, update it. I just need to say, make sure I'm at the latest version. That's what declarative means in this case. All right, so, um, so single commands are great, and they're, they're good for those one-off type tasks, like checking to make sure you're not exposed to heart bleed. Um, but you can build these tasks together into playbooks. Um, this way you can not just make sure that OpenSSL is all the way up to date, but you can deploy a, a, an entire LAMP stack, your app, set up database databases, and test to make sure they're up before you exit your, your script. Um, but first, let's talk about inventories. Inventories are a way to organize your systems into different collections that make sense to your organizations. Um, for example, you can group servers by geography so that stuff like NTP servers or uh, mirrors to check updates to or um, you know other kind of localized settings can be set as on a geographic group level. You can group servers by purpose so that you can have Database servers treated differently from web servers, treated differently from, um, I don't know, your backup infrastructure service servers. Uh, and you can, you can also group them by machine type or by kind of physical characteristics. Um, so there are three things, three, three types of items that you would list in an inventory, a simple, First is, is the, uh, you'll notice it kind of looks like an INI file. Um, in, inside your, your bracket is a group name, and then below that you will list hosts. Hosts and then specific values that pertain just to that host. And then you'll also notice on, in that third line, there's a, a shortcut instead of listing S3, S4, S5, S6, all the way to S30, you can say S3 colon 30 to expand to all of those. You can also group groups into a hierarchy, and you do that by saying metagroup one colon children is group one, which is the group defined above. And so you can build, uh, so a, a machine can exist in more than one group, um, so you can have a database server in the East Coast region, um, but it's a you know an eight-way Xeon, and so it, this one machine can be a member of these these different groups. Um, so I mentioned the brackets and and the hierarchies. For the most part, as a best practice, you want to keep variables besides connection variables. Like variables that you need to set in order to connect to a host, like what, is, what SSH user do you use? What port does it need to go over? Um, those, those are the kinds of var variables you would keep in, a, in an inventory file, but most Ansible variables, or most variables that you'd want to set, you'll want to do in a, different, in a different way that I'll show in a minute. Okay, so an inventory lets you only run specific tasks or, or it lets you organize the variables or the configuration for, for the servers in, in a way that makes sense. All right, I'm gonna kind of show you rather than try to tell you. Um, all right, so I got Figureize this. All right, so this is a this is an inventory file for a two-host system that I run our production server on right now. Um, I use localhost because I have to tunnel into a VPC in in AWS in order to connect to it. So um, where you see localhost and one two seven dot zero zero dot two. Imagine those are two different hosts, host names. Um, 
and you'll notice the SSH ports are in there. I also set a host name variable um, because I have commands in my Ansible playbook that set the host name on the machine. Um, and this is kind of the best way to do that. Um, but you'll see also that I have, basically, I've divided my, my stuff into Ansible availability, or a AWS availability zones. Um, and then further by machine type. So I have ZZ9 servers, DB servers, and then web servers. Um, and then I've got them collected into a web servers group, a DB servers group, a ZZ9 servers group, and then beta, which is the whole, the whole shebang. Um, and so when I, run a, when I run an Ansible playbook, the tasks that pertain to ZZ9 servers, um, ZZ9 is our our database system, our, our homegrown database system, those, those tasks that pertain to ZZ9 servers will only run on those machines. Those tasks that pertain to web servers will only run on the web servers. Um, and those tasks that pertain to beta as a group will run on all of the machines. <coughs> so what does that look like? And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, but that looks like uh, this. No, no. There we go. Okay. So I have um, for the hosts, DB servers, web servers, and ZZ9 servers run the common role. A common a role is a is a set of tasks that that um, that I'm asking it to complete and then so forth for the other roles that are in this, um, in the file. And I'll, I'll explain what roles are in a minute. So, um, Ansible also lets you, because of the grouping system, you can differentiate between your, d d between your hosts by purpose as well. Um, so staging can be this can use the same playbook as your production system as can your all of your testing infrastructure um, just by making variations to your inventories um, I'm probably jumbling this up a little bit um, so if you have questions please feel free to stop me and, and uh, I'll try to <laughs> Try to make it clear. Um, okay, so what about all of these configuration variables? The way that you set those up is through through variables that match up to your groups. For example, um, in this 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 represents a directory structure in your in your playbook system. Um, Ansible might be your root level. Underneath that, you'll have an inventories directory. Under inventories, you'll have testing, development, staging, produ production, inventories. And then under group vars, you'll have, uh, as a subdirectory, you'll have, um, you'll have sets of files that des describe the configuration changes that happen in each of those groups that you've defined in your inventories. So for example, with a special uh, group called all, all would be kind of the, the lowest level, default level of, of configuration. So all and is a list of all of the variables that you define that can later be overridden by more specific groups. Um, so, the, so production variables can override all if you had production, like production ZZ9 servers, that would also, um, that would override production and so forth. So you can have different sets of configuration for different deployment scenarios. So I have my production group variables and then I have vagrant group variables because my vagrant install is, is a little bit different from, from my production. Namely, I don't install my SSH, my SSH or I don't install SSH keys in Vagrant, and I don't, and I set up a self-signed certificate in Vagrant, and I don't do that 
in production. You can also use group variables if you've set up um, geography, geographic groups um, this way. So you could set in no North Virgi Northern Virginia, you could have um, NTP servers that are pertinent to those servers um, and so forth. So that looks like So this is a, a list of variables that I use to, to deploy my, our application. So I have things in here like whether or not to use Nginx, whether or not to use Redis, whether to use a local copy of Redis or use Elastic, uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the service that Amazon provides. What ports to listen to, how many HTTP threads, um, what the per public URL is, which is amazingly difficult to determine from inside an app um, sometimes. A couple of repo names, uh, some magic about, uh, so name host is host name backwards, so that, that magic there takes the, the public host name, splits it on the periods, reverses it, and stuffs it all back together. Um, so public domain, because cookies happen on the domain. Some uh, keys and some uh, Mongo information, file limits, um, and so forth. Anyway, so this is, this is the list of variables that we've determined are necessary to, to, de to define our app. And if I need to override any single one of these or any group of them, I can create, I can create a, a new group vars file that pertains just to that set of systems. Um, okay. So vari variables have a defined or, or well, well defined w precedence order. At the top are command line variables. Those override everything. Host variables, group variables, or rather, yeah, host variables then are the next most important things. So in addition to group vars, you can set up host vars with files underneath that match specific host names in your inventories. Um, group variables, like all, um, and then facts that are discovered from the system itself, like using that setup module. Um, and that facts, those facts are collected on every Ansible playbook run unless you de de disable it. So one thing that I do, um, try to be a little bit flexible about how, how the app deploys. Um, Python has this thing called the global interpreter lock. That means that if you have a Python process inside the C code that is running Python, it locks itself to a single processor. So even if you have a multi-threaded application, it only runs on a single app, single processor. So what that means is you want to fire up, if you have four processors running, you want to for, fire up four Python processes so that you have one process running on each, um, on each process, processor. And in order to do that, I take the facts that I've discover from the system and do some simple math on it. So I look at the number of processors, the number of cores in each processor, and the number of threads in each core. And I multiply all those together and that gives me a number of how many Python processors processes to run in, in, the, defined, in, the, in the deployed system. Generally you want to keep these variables tidy so you don't have to look too many places to see which value will stick. Um, so don't use all of these, but um, they're all useful. I don't tend to use the command line variables except when you say, oh no, this isn't working. Let me, <laughs> I don't have time to change the files. Just override it. 
So what kinds of things? We've already lo looked at some of them. Here are a couple more. Um, these are some things that might vary from one inventory group to the next. Um, here are some things that might vary from one environment to the next. So variables let you handle these variations without messing up your playbooks too much. Um, what, yes? Okay, so this, this is the introduction to Ansible. I haven't yet gotten to the, the AWS thing. Does that help? Um, so the question was, he's uh, new to Ansible and AWS. He's wondering what kinds of things he needs to do to just get started. Um, and I will get to the where, where I drive an AWS using Ansible in just a few minutes. Um, I want to kind of explain what, but basically, in order to get started with Ansible for the first time, I would set up a playbook to run against Vagrant or run against your, uh, maybe a, a virtual host that you have running locally, um, or even a Vagrant, or even an Ansible playbook that would run against the local system, um, because the round trip times are, are much faster. You see, when we connected to, to to Amazon, so this is actually going out to Amazon to run this update command, but it takes a chunk of time just because of the latencies involved. Um, so you want to you want to debug on a local or as close to the the system that you're working on as possible. That's kind of my rule of thumb for everything. I always try to build and and maintain my my Ansible playbooks against local systems because I can do things quickly. Yes. So the question is, uh, if you have you have uh, inventories and variables, how can you compose them? Is that Okay, so so the question is, are the are the variables that you set up specific to a playbook, or are they specific to a role, or are they specific to an inventory group? Um, variables are I I consider in Ansible uh, the playbooks to be kind of an independent entity, the groups to be kind of an independent entity, and the variables to be an extension of the groups, and so I can set up multiple playbooks that use the same inventories, um, or I can, uh, or I can also I can use one a single playbook to drive all of my processes. I can do both. Um, I happen to use a couple of different playbooks, mostly to do. Um, mostly, I have a bunch of tiny playbooks to do specific tasks that I have to do regularly, and then I have a big giant playbook that says starting with a base image 
get me to the point where I'm running my application. Um, okay. Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, where does Ansible run? Is uh, basically that Ansible will run. So Ansible to be installed on the on the driving system needs Python and a couple of other packages. Bodo if you're driving AWS, Yum if you're driving if you're using Yum, um, apt Python if you're trying to use use it on Ubuntu. Um, but on remote systems, all Ansible needs is an SSH daemon and the Python binary. Um, so, and it, Python 2, 3, and later. So it'll run against um, RHEL 5 even. Um, maybe RHEL 4, I don't remember. Anyway, so it'll, uh, so what Ansible does is it remote shells to, to the whatever system, it drops a Python script in onto that s system and then shells again to call that shell script and, uh, and do whatever it needs to do. All, all of the dependencies that are needed for that Python script that it drops get slurped up by Ansible and stuffed into that file so that it <laughs> It's it's amazingly amazing. Basically, it's a it's a clientless um, management system. Puppet and Chef, I think, both require having some kind of client running on the on their managed box. But Ansible, you can connect to any box that has SSH and Python. Okay. So let's look at a playbook. This is a very very simple playbook that connects to hosts named web servers. These are groups that you set up. Um, it sets some playbook specific variables that as we saw before, will override certain other variables, um, but can also be overridden by command line or arguments or whatever. Um, tells us what user to run as remotely, and then lists a set of tasks. These tasks are inline here, but they can also be rolled into a role and, and stuffed in a different file so that you can reuse roles um, in different playbooks. But this one has three tasks. One is to make sure that Apache is at the latest version. Two is to take a templated a Apache config file out of um, out of serve httpd.j2, process it. It's a template file. It's not a, it's not a file that it just copies over. Processing usually means substituting in variables for placeholders. And then stuff it in the destination at etchttpd.conf. And then the third task ensures that Apache is running by checking to make sure that the service is started. There, you'll also notice there's this notify line in the, in the playbook. It, the notify line actually says, if you've made a change on this line, restart Apache. Um, and then that's, it's, it's run by handlers at the very bottom. Okay. So I ha why do I have Apache like services handling twice here? Um, the first, this ensure that Apache is running, is in case, well, actually, I probably don't need it. Um, but in some cases, you might have a service that's installed but isn't actually started. Um, and then the handlers, Handlers run after all other processing has completed for that playbook. Okay, so I can say, do all this stuff, and at the very, very end, 
restart MySQL or uh, or restart Nginx or Apache or something. Okay. Um, the host section, we talked about it. Um, it limits the scope. So in, the, in this one here, I'm not going to run database commands on my web servers unless, my, unless I'm installing in an org, into a system that will have all three collapsed onto a single box. But then that box will also be in the database group. I'm not going to run backups on throwaway servers. I'm not going to set up NTP. I, I am going to set up NTP on all my file servers. And I'm going to set up logging and SNMP on all production servers. So handlers are special tasks. They run at the end of the playbook if they are, they are notified. Notifications only happen if something has changed in that particular task. If you copy a file and the file is, is as the original, then it says nothing's changed and it doesn't have to restart the service, right? Um, and you don't have to program any of that. It just does it for you. Um, tasks are things to do. They happen in order. And um, you can use any of the Ansible's 40 or 50 different modules and growing all the time. Or you can write your own modules um, very simply. And then roles are external lists of tasks so that you can reuse them over and over again. Um, roles kind of flow, for me, they flow from some common componentry. Um, common role might involve setting up SSH, setting the host name. Um, data role might schedule backups. A Postgres role might set up Postgres. Tasks are designed to be item potent. If you run one task over and over and over again, you should be able to expect at the end of the task that it will leave you in the same state as the first time you ran it. The difference is on the output of the task, most modules will say if something has changed or not. Um, and then if it has changed, it can notify. So again, uh, you try to be declarative. You describe a desired state, not the steps it takes to get there. So when starting Nginx, you don't have to say, if Nginx is not running, start it. You just say, I want Nginx to be started. And it does the right thing. It does nothing if it's already running. Um, OK, so, so modules take care of all of those state fluctuations. Um, the error code checking, initial state. So when, when you say reload or restart Apache, if Apache is already running, then it calls restart. If it's not running, it just calls start. Um, and then it, it takes, the modules take care of whether, of detecting whether these changes have occurred. There are a bunch of built-in modules. There's also a new galaxy.ansible.com which is uh, user contributed modules. So you can find modules for just about everything. They even have modules for driving the Microsoft Cloud. They have <laughs> modules for driving Azure, the Microsoft Cloud. Um, you can find modules for AWS you can or EC2. You can find modules for OpenStack. You can find modules for Rackspace. You can find modules for um, Are there modules for VMware? I'm sure that somebody somewhere has done that. If you can run it through a command line, if you can run it as a programmatic system, then I'm sure somebody has started that at least. Um, yes? So there's generic modules like there's a command line module that says run this command, give me the results. Um, and then there is 
specific software like EC2 that says launch this instance, connect these um, EBS volumes, and give me the IP addresses of the of the systems that were launched. Um, there's kind of a mix. There's a, a mix of general purpose modules and then application specific modules. Yes. Right. Those modules would con would expose certain parameters that you could configure with variables um, or in your playbook. So there are also control variable or controls that you can add to tasks. You can perform similar tasks via loops or skip tasks based on facts or other variable checks. Um, so here, the first line is a is a fact is a a when clause. I will only run tasks using this when clause when it is not vagrant and it is not production. So basically, my test environment. With file says for every line in that file, run it. So I have a list. I have a file of all the SSH keys of all the developers in the company, and so when the test servers get deployed, all the devs have SSH access to it. Um, there's a file glob that says for every file in this directory, do this thing over and over again. Uh, with items, so I can list that the the items that I need. Sequence gives me a, a kind of a way to count or do a for loop. Um, I can also set tags on a task. Um, this, these are very useful for debugging um, or running sections of your playbook. I have a full stack application, but frequently we just push the, the client UI, which is the HTML and JavaScript. And so I have a shortcut in my playbook so that I can just run the update of the client code. Um, there's also an include. So you can include a set of tasks um, into, a, into a bigger playbook. Um, I'll use include, for example, if I have a bunch of tasks that I need to run with one variable and then a, I need to run them again with a second variable. I can use a, a with clause with the include. Um, templates, as I mentioned earlier, are actually Jinja files. Jinja has a, a file format that lets you embed Python and other variable substitution um, in inside them. So it lets you do put variables inside config files, and you. Um, so this is where the configuration management comes in. So I can set up uh, my base nginx config file with placeholders for things like what port to listen on and, and whether or not to use self-signed SSL. And then um, Ansible, when it runs, would use those variables in those template files and before it dumps it into the system. If you're writing a task and you get stuck, use a tag so that you can iterate over that quickly. Um, Uh, and then use the debug module to, to look at variables as your task sees them. And then dash VVVV gives you all of the output. Um, and we'll look what, look, see what that looks like in just a minute. So that's a, a, a very quick overview of what Ansible looks like. And then this is what your project will look like after you've, you've built a, a reasonably complete um, playbook system. You'll have under a root directory, Ansible, you'll have inventories, which we've already seen. Roles will be broken up into uh, different role names. And under each role, like DB tier, you will have files, which are files to just be copied. They don't have any variable replacement. You'll have handlers, which will define a set of tasks that listen to events. You'll have those tasks themselves and templates, which are the templatable files that get copied from the system. You'll also probably ha maybe have a library where you will have your custom modules. And finally, at the root level, you'll have your playbook. Any questions about that? So files are, are 
Um, I have this file, I need to copy it over. So I have this configuration file and I need it to be copied over. I don't use it for um, copying large amounts of data. I can use rsync or something for that. Um, but for example, if I have, let's see what kinds of things do I have in file. Um, probably SSL keys that are not, um, they're not variableized. <laughs> Um, those go in there. I, I actually keep one, one file per SSL key. Um, so I use uh, variables in the playbook to determine which file, but I don't actually change the file, so I don't use the templates. Does that make sense? So, so files that are not changed in the copying over, I'll put in files. Files that are changed, I'll put in templates. All right, so um, so let's see what it looks like. So I'm gonna I'm gonna now show you a playbook that uh, is linked to dynamic inventory um, that starts an AWS spot instance with a base AMI, updates it, configures it, runs a benchmark on it, that, and the benchmark itself sends the results to Datadog and then tears the whole thing down. And since this is a cooking show, I'll show you what that output looks like. Um, So um, this is a set of playbooks. Uh, so, so I didn't mention earlier, but our playbooks are defined in a YAML file that gives us a hierarchy without a lot of overhead like you might get from XML. Um, we, I call it benchmark stuff. The host, I'm actually using localhost to start with because I'm going to run all these EC2 commands using environment variables that I've set on my local house with my, um, my key and my, my access key and my secret key to, to Amazon. I'm going to read in some other, other variables from, environment, from the environment, variables that I actually set up using Jenkins um, with parameterized builds so that my users can actually select what instance type they want at what spot price. Um, and I can easily change the AMI and the kernel and the instance name without having to modify my, my playbook at all. So I have a set of tasks here. The basically one, one task to launch this, in, these instances. The name of the, of the of the task is launch EC2 instances. Register says, I want to record the result of this in a variable I name EC2. So I can reference EC2 later as a variable in later playbooks. It's a local action. I'm going to run it against the local machine. I'm going to use the EC2 module, which is built into Ansible. And then I'm going to use these variables, um, the key pair, the instance type, the spot price, the count, the group, image, the kernel, the instance tags, the region. Most of these you don't need if you're just starting up. Um, but I found that these are interesting or useful in order to keep track of them later. Wait says, don't continue in the playbook until you've gotten a response from Amazon that that system is, is running. Um, that means that the module takes care of all the polling for you. You don't have to do that inside your code. I set up my ephemeral devices. I just set up all four because I don't know if I don't want to branch in my code based on, and Amazon seems to do the right thing anyway. 
Okay, so after all of that is finished, I'm gonna add the, each instance that started. I'm only using one, but you could use 100 here. It'll do the same thing. I'm gonna add each instance to a, a group called launch. And I'm gonna set the host name. And I'm gonna set a variable for that host with the public DNS name. Okay, so this is, this is tying back to that EC2. Um, so that's going to be for every item in ec2.instances, I'm going to run this action. So what that's, what that's going to do is create a launched group that I'm going to use later in the script. This is kind of complicated. Are there questions about this? You guys are smart. All right, so, um, and then, you know, because I'm the way I am, I'm going to output that ec2 vari variable too so that I can make sure that I have the, so I know what the structure of that variable is. It's not the easiest thing, or it's not as straightforward as you might think. Because when you register a variable, you're not just registering the result, you're also getting the standard out, the standard input, or the standard error, standard out, the return, the, the status code if you're running a command, and lots of other things. So there's a structure to the variable. It's not just a flat um, key value. Um, and then I'm going to further wait. So Amazon will return, say it's running, but SSH may not have come up yet. So I'm going to wait until SSH does come up. And this is using a built-in module called wait for, wait for. And it looks at a specific port. Um, and checks every 90, minute, 90 seconds with a 320 second timeout. Um, and then I set up a couple of tags in case I want to skip those steps for debugging purposes. Okay, so now that I have all of those new Amazon instances set up in this launched group, I can run stuff on them. So you'll see these roles, I, these are the same roles I use in my big playbook. I'm going to reuse them here. I'm going to run common. I'm going to run crunch. I'm going to run ZZ9 and data storage tier. Um, I'm going to skip DB and I'm going to skip web tier because I'm not running benchmarks on those parts of the system. I'm only running benchmarks on ZZ9. Yes. So the question is, am I running? So, so I was running at the first, first part. I was running against localhost. This, where I have this, 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 you can't really tell, but this is a new root scope playbook. Okay, so the, so we're in a, so this is a one playbook, two playbooks. So each playbook can have a different scope of servers that it runs against. So this one runs against hosts in the launched group. Whereas the previous playbook, I'm stringing these three playbook, these four playbooks together to form a single meta playbook. Um, but each part runs against a different set of ho hosts. I see confused looks. Right. But, okay, so y the way the YAML works is by indentation is your scope. So we've, our, we've back indented all the way back to the root scope. And so instead of using host local host, now we're going to use host launched. So it's like we've closed the, the, the curly brace and now we're running something, running a different set of tasks against a different set of servers. Yes? So mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm running the first set of tasks against the local host because I don't have anything to run against. In the first task, I create the, t the servers to run against register them into a group called launched, and then I can now run 
new commands against that launched group. These are the launched group contains all of the servers that I set up in the previous task or the previous playbook. So this looks like my production deployment script right here. This is where it says roles because um, those are the same tasks that I run or the same roles that I run in my production servers. Um, and that sets up all the software. I don't have to start with an AMI that I've built myself. I do because I've got some data loaded on it. But if I was good and I had done all my, all my due diligence, I would have put that data in, EC, in S3 and let the, the instance pull it down before it started processing. But I'm not that smart. So I, I preload the, the image that I have with, with my data, but I still connect to it to make sure that it has the latest software. So I run, run my full deployment on it. Well, most of it anyway. Um, then I do a little bit of configuration so that I can run those benchmarks from a remote system and turn off query timeouts and those kinds of things, restart everything, wait for it to come up, and then finally run the benchmarks. On the bench, here I am running against localhost again, because I'm going to use the local copy of my benchmark suite to run these queries against the remote server. I usually run this from, um, from Jenkins, so it's actually in the same data center, um, but this, this is the, the way that I, I actually run those benchmarks. And I have a tag here so I can just run bench or I can skip the benchmarks completely and just start with the scratch system that is there and has data loaded and I can just throw it away when I'm done. I also register here the output variable and I ignore errors. This is kind of important if you're trying to drive Amazon remotely and you don't want to rack up lots and lots of charges because you have an automated system that runs this every, every so often and leaves stuff running. So you ignore errors, but you register the re result so that you can check it later and fail the build e after you've terminated all your instances. Okay, so the next part we're gonna run against localhost again. Uh, this is going to go through and with state equals absent, we'll terminate all the items in the there's that EC2 variable again, the one that we created in the very first playbook. Um, so all of the instance IDs created in the first task, or the first playbook, now get shut down. And, and now we check, look at that variable. I spit it out so that I can see what it looks like. Um, check the result, give a message, and then fail the build if it if it wasn't successful. Okay. I'm going to post this somewhere so that you don't have to scramble and copy it down. Um, I don't think there's anything proprietary in there. <laughs> I may sanitize a little bit the commands that we actually use. Um, but the, and that's it, all right? I, I set up new instances. I run all the configuration I need to on it. I run my benchmark. I record the result, I tear it down, then I check the result and fail or, or complete the build successfully. Any questions about that? Yes, the dynamic group is the cool part. Um, I can set that group up with one instance or a thousand instances just by changing that one line where it says count equals one. And I could make that a variable on the command line, or the, in the environment variable too, or I could use the, the command line. Um, the thing I've always have found difficult about using EC2 is the ephemeral nature of it, the, the nature that they want you to use these systems as disposable. That's been really hard for me because I don't know all the setup that you need to do in order to make an instance disposable. For me, an inst for an instance to be useful, it needs data, it needs software, it needs all of the setup. Well, with Ansible now, 
I can drive it as a, like, Ansible is, or AWS is my compute cluster. I can set up single tasks or, or, single, or sets of tasks. I can say from one system that is not ephemeral, go do this stuff. And then when it's done, shut it all down. And I can run a thousand instances for short periods of time. And, and not rack up lots and lots of charges because I'm using servers in, that are permanent. And I don't have to do lots of setup to say, go grab this data from, e from S3, record the results back to S3. I just have to build that into my software a little bit. Okay. So we started EC2 instances. We updated and configured them. We ran a set of tests, recorded the results, and tore the whole thing down. Um, that takes, in my Jenkins build, um, to run the whole set of benchmarks, set up the instances with spot instances, which are even cheaper than, than registered instances in Amazon usually. Um, takes about 20 minutes to run all of that. Um, okay, so, so these are some links to Ansible documents um, and how to get a hold of me. So I'm ready now to take your questions, those that you haven't asked already. We have about five minutes. I keep all my playbooks and inventories and variables in a Git repository. You have to put them in somewhere. They have to live somewhere because they can't just be in your head. We've made a decision that our GitHub our Git repository is sufficiently safe from prying eyes. We could do something with Blowfish or something to, to encrypt those files more on disk. Um, we tend to only have things that can be discarded in there anyway. I can generate new API keys. I can. Um, I can generate new SSH key, SSL, actually I don't put SSL keys in there anymore because I use load balancers and they're loaded there instead. Um, but like Amazon API keys, I can throw those away. I can put new ones up if they ever get compromised. Well, I showed you how you could pull them from the environment variables. There's also command line options. Um, you could write a file to temp in, a, in tempfs or something if you wanted to do that. So that, uh, the way, so the question is, is there a way to use executable code to grab that data? Yes, you would extend the, um, the load command. So load will also load from files. It'll load, I think there might actually be code to load from the output of a, of a command. Um, but we're talking about automated processes here. At some point, all your secrets are on the table anyway. Um, like if you've got a special uh, passphrase that you use to decrypt all of your sensitive data, then you have to either be sitting at the computer to enter that passphrase every time, or it's sitting just in some other place on your system so that it can be run in an automated fashion. All right, so, so I don't go overboard. Maybe I'm not paranoid enough, or I work for a company where it's, we're small enough that nobody cares about us anyway um, yet, but uh, I'm also not a black hat. <laughs> right. 
Right, so, so the, he says that I should be using two-factor auth and, and so forth. And, and um, what I do is I have um, AM, or I, IAM keys per environment that limit their scope, but what, what they have access to in S3. Um, and I'm working on off-site backups to make sure that nothing untoward happens. Other questions? Um, yes. What do I think about Ansible Tower and the commercial support? I think you should get it. No, I, I, I know the guys at Ansible. Um, I worked with many of them at our path when I was there. Um, they are doing some amazing things. I, uh, I don't think I'm to the point yet where I need Ansible Tower. Um, I think if you've got an infrastructure where you can maintain it with flat files, then you don't need it. Um, but it, so what Ansible Tower does is a lot of the dynamic group stuff. They can pull all your inventories from databases or from, from wherever. Um, but I don't know a lot about Ansible Tower. They'd be happy, I'm sure, to, to sell you on it. That's all I think. Um, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.